بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على من بعث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers and sisters I am your brother Abu Abdul Salam uh, speaking to you live from Mecca and uh, we have some very interesting questions today um, and if you do have any questions just write them down in this uh, in the chat below um, and inshallah we'll try and answer as many questions as we can there's a bunch of questions that I've been sent um, so I'm going to try and answer them and then also go on to the questions that you guys are posting here today how are you guys anyway how are you let me know um, where you're speaking from where you're watching from and uh, inshallah I'll be reading out the comments and replying to them uh, inshallah as we are in this session Yahya mashallah Yahya is here nice to see that you're watching Yahya uh, hope you're doing your work as well inshallah okay so the first question is I want to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but how can I do it? I simply cannot do it. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to change. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, this is a very, very important question. And this shows that the person who asks this question is a person who has a good heart, inshallah. This person who asks the question on how can I get closer to Allah it shows that you, brother or sister, who has asked this question, it, it really shows that you've got some good in you. Because the first thing that you need to do is to actually, uh, the first thing that you need to do is actually uh, recognize the problem. And alhamdulillah, you ha seem to have done that. Uh, in that you want to get close to Allah, but you feel that you're not close to Allah. But my question to you is, why do you feel that you're not close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? Why do you feel that? Now, before we talk about that, I need to shut this door because it's getting hot in here. Right, that's better. Feeling a bit better, alhamdulillah. Okay, so basically, uh, where was I? So when you feel that, why do you feel that you're not close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Now it could be a number of reasons. Maybe you are not doing certain acts of worship that you feel that you should be doing, right? For example, the prayer. Uh, maybe you're not consistent in your prayer. Maybe you're backbiting. Maybe you feel that you have some pride. Maybe you are slandering people. Maybe you've oppressed somebody. Uh, I don't know. Whatever that thing is, uh, you need to figure out what is the reason why. Um, or maybe, you know, so it could be that you're engaging in a sin or you're not doing the things that you're supposed to be doing. And maybe that's why you feel that you're not close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how can we build a strong relationship with Allah that is permanent? The first thing that I want to address here is that your Iman is never going to be like this, right? You're not going to be constant. In your life, you're going to go up and you're going to go down. You're going to go up and you're going to go down. And this is the case no matter how uh, knowledgeable you are, whether you're a scholar, whether you're an, an abid, a worshipper, you know, it doesn't matter, right? As Muslims, we believe that Iman our faith increases and it decreases, right? Imam, uh, Iman increases and it decreases. So how does Iman, how does our faith increase? Right? The scholars of the past, they said something, they gave a, a simple formula. That Iman increases when you do good deeds. And Iman decreases when you do bad deeds. Right? So, any time that your Iman is low, Right. Any time that your Iman is low, there's a simple solution to that. Just get up and do a good deed. Right? Just do a good deed. Now that could be something as simple as saying Subhanallah wa bihamdihi Subhanallah al-Azim or just Subhanallah even. Right? 
or Alhamdulillah. It could be simply saying with your tongue, Astaghfirullah. How difficult is that? Right? The minute you do that, then you've, you've taken one step towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not difficult, right? You could be on the bus, in the car, walking, you could be waiting, right? Whatever you do, right? It's not difficult to say Astaghfirullah, for example, right? That's not difficult to do. But what, is, uh, but what you need to do, brothers and sisters, is use that Astaghfirullah as like a, uh, uh, you know, like a trigger, all right? It's like, a, um, it's like a springboard to bounce you off. And the, so the first piece of advice I would give you, if you want to build a strong and powerful relationship with Allah, the first thing to do is very simple, is do good deeds, right? Do good deeds. It doesn't matter how sinful you are. It doesn't matter how great your sin is. The first thing that you want to do is do good deeds, any good deed, right? Whether, even if it's something as simple as saying Astaghfirullah, 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 right? Or Subhanallah. This will slowly help you at least do something that will increase your Iman. The second thing, that, the second piece of advice that I give you is to be firm in your prayers, okay? Be firm in your prayers. Uh, brothers and sisters, look, we all go through Iman ups and downs, right? And like I said, your Iman will always fluctuate. But the situation that you want to be in is that whenever you're, when you're on a trough, when you're, when you're on a down in your Iman, you want to make sure you're above the bare minimum, right? The bare minimum. What does that mean? It means that make sure you're praying five times a day. Now, shaitan comes with a very powerful trick. And that trick is to tell you that, you know what, I'm not good enough to pray. What's the point of praying when I'm, when I'm doing this sin or that sin? And this sin could be a major sin, right? What's the point of praying? This is what shaitan does to trick us. Um, or maybe if a person is, you know, praying his sunnah or he is, you know, uh, you know, whatever he or she is doing, good deeds. Maybe he's getting up for tahajjud and then he falls into a sin. What does shaitan do? What's the point of doing those good deeds when you are doing this sin or that sin? Listen, let, take it from me. There's not a single person on earth that doesn't sin, right? There's not a single person. And this is said by our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. كُلُّ بْنَ آدَمْ خَطَّاءُ وَخَيْرُ الْخَطَّائِينَ that every son of Adam sins and the best of sinners are those who repent, right? So the second piece of advice is to make sure that you insist on your prayers. Like this is the no compromisable, the non-compromisable. This is the thing that, you know, even if you're sinning, you're still going to do your prayers. Now you might ask yourself, what's the point of praying when uh, I'm doing this sin or that sin? The reality is, I'll tell you what the point is. We don't know how long a person may end up in the hellfire for every single prayer, right? We don't know. Could it be a million years, five million years, a hundred million years? We, we honestly don't know. Allah hasn't told us in the Quran. The Prophet ﷺ hasn't told us in the Sunnah. So every prayer you miss, right? It could be a long time in the hellfire for that one prayer that you miss and you can't get that prayer back it's very you know it's like you can't get that prayer back so even if you're sinning it doesn't make sense to add extra sin right it's like somebody who's not wearing a seat belt in the car and then he says oh you know what's the point of following other traffic rules i may as well jump the red light as well i may as well go through the red light as well it doesn't make sense right Maybe you get a hundred pounds fine if you don't have the seatbelt on. But maybe you'll get, you know, a, a thousand pounds fine if you go through the red light, right? It, just because you're not wearing a seatbelt, it's not logical that you simply say, okay, because of that, I'm, I'm going to do another sin or I'm going to break the law somewhere else. So it doesn't really make sense at all. Uh, so number one, do any good deed. Number two, make sure that you insist on doing your prayers. And remember Allah says in the Quran, Inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar, that the prayers, they stop a person from doing evil and immorality.
right? Immorality and evil, right? So the prayers are the things that stop you. And it also helps you to get your sins forgiven. So uh, that's the second thing. And number three, always repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every time you sin. Uh, don't give up um, at any time. So I'm just going to go to another question. Adil Raja, he says, Salam AA. Wa alaykum as salam, Adil. Um, feels like only this morning I spoke to you last. It certainly does. I, I remember you very well, my brother. Um, if Allah is all powerful, why does He need angels? Right? Why does He need angels? Allah doesn't need angels. Um, Allah is all powerful. He can do whatever He wants. He owns this universe. He owns you. He owns me. So the reality is, Allah doesn't need angels. Okay? He doesn't need angels, but He can. Right? He can own them. You know, he, he created them because he can. He has the ability to do so. And of course, there's wisdom in everything. And the angels, they worship Allah day and night without uh, any slacking, without disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh, you know, this is a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah has created them because he can and because of the wisdom. Um, need to have better understanding of Quran. Videos with translation are helpful, but if you can recommend anything else, a book or any video. Um, this is by Mifra Shazib. And then they go on to say, plus how can we keep constant in doing ibadah regularly? A constant reminder every day for the fear of Allah and death each and every second during ibadah. Okay, um, so your first question, how can we... Uh, any good stuff, any good, anything I can recommend for Quran with, uh, you know, to get a better understanding of the Quran. Um, I think the first thing uh, is read a translation of the Quran, right? Many of us, they... <laughs> I just seen some, one, some of the questions are hilarious. Okay, we'll, we'll get to that, inshallah. Okay, we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> some of the questions are hilarious. But don't worry, you can ask any question you want. Okay, that's what this is for, inshallah. We'll try and answer these questions to the best of our ability, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, anyway, uh, let's get back to the point. What was it? About the Qur'an. So how do we get close to the Qur'an? How can we understand the Qur'an? The first thing is to read it. Read the Qur'an, um, you know, in Arabic, but also try and read the Qur'an in a with a translation. Ponder over it. Think about it. What does Allah mean when He says, you know, this word or that word. So try and firstly read the translation of the Quran end to end. All of us has read a book in our lives. What is sad that most people have not read the whole Quran from beginning to end or a translation of it in a language that they understand. In today's time, you really don't have an excuse, right? You don't have an excuse. The Quran has been translated into so many different languages. You don't have an excuse. So at least... Make an effort, like Ramadan's in about, what, 44, 45 days roughly. Um, go away and try and finish the Qur'an in a language that you can understand or a translation of it, if you don't understand Arabic. Try and understand that uh, so that you get the gist of the Qur'an. And then the next step would be to perhaps read some tafsir. In English, of course, there is tafsir Ibn Kathir, which is very good. Um, you also have um, Bayna TV. Um, I know a lot of people, they speak well about that. Uh, Brother Nu'man, he's done some great stuff on the, uh, you know, making the Qur'an close to a person. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him for that. So that's probably worth uh, looking at as well. How do we keep constant in our ibadah? Well, the, the short answer to this, how do we keep constant is to force yourself, is to force yourself. And over time, something that is difficult, it starts off really difficult, over time, it begins to become easier, right? And then over time, you begin to like it. Initially, you might dislike it, right? Then you might tolerate it. And then you begin to like it. And then you begin to say, you know what? I love this act of ibadah. And then eventually, when you keep on doing this act of ibadah, it, there comes a point where you say, I can't do without this act of ibadah. You know, it, I'm so addicted to this act of ibadah. Um, that, you know, I can't possibly do without it. Okay, what else have we got here? Can you please pray for me? Amimul Ihsan Khan. Can you pray for me so that I can pass my physics exam this semester? I've already given the exam. Allah! 
I am so tensed. I can almost feel the tense coming through uh, the internet. Um, so, I mean, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make easy all your affairs that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything that will get you closer to Allah and make you happy in this world and in the next. I mean, and may this physics exam be among those things and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for you. I mean, but don't forget, you need to make dua. I mean, I living in Mecca, I get so many people telling me, make dua for me, make dua for me, make dua for me. Now, brother and sister, I could make dua for you, of course, and inshallah, you know, the, we will make dua for you. But it is more important for you to make dua for yourself. Allah says in the Quran, Qala Rabbukum astajib lakum. My, Your Lord said, make dua to me and I will respond to you. Allah is telling you, make dua to me and I'll respond to you. So you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and keep on making dua. You know, some, subhanAllah, there's something that I do if I want to make dua for something. And trust me, there's been loads of times in my life where I desperately need something. Or I'm in a situation that's really tough. Uh, what do I do? I make dua for it like all the time. Okay, so after every prayer, between the adhan and iqama, you know, uh, if, if I, you know, at all the times, you can do so before Fajr, you know, in the last third of the night. The point I'm making is the more dua that you make, the more likely that dua, that at least one of those duas will get answered. So if you're making dua like a thousand times, think about it, the chances out of those thousand times you've made dua, the chances of one of them being accepted by Allah because one of them, you are really sincere and you are really, you know, desperate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah answered that dua. So repeat the duas over and over and over again. Don't just make dua once and say, Yalla, that's it. No, make dua over and over again and inshallah, at least one of them will be answered. And trust me, there's been some miracles in my life. Uh, you know, when I say miracle, I mean that things that I could not imagine, right? I could not imagine how they would be answered but just by regularly making dua regularly all the time subhanallah it becomes easy for us okay next question oh some of these questions are tough like they're all lectures in and of themselves let's have a look you guys are, are giving me a tough time with your questions huh right let's have a look let's have a look uh, how do you understand Qadr? How can you be content with it? How to understand that it's Allah's plan and even if it seems like the people are making it all go wrong or right, right? Okay, Qadr is one of the most amazing aspects of our belief. Right? I believe that it's one, you know, to believe in Qadr correctly and to have tawakkul in Allah trust and reliance in Allah. Qadr of course means, you know, predestination, right? Destiny, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destines everything. Um, for me, this is one of the most powerful aspects of our deen, right? Why? Because this belief in Qadr, what it ends up doing, it, it actually helps us so much so that it ends up, right? It ends up giving you happiness in this world. Right? It gives you happiness in this world and it stops you from feeling anxious and feeling depressed and you know, getting upset uh, when things happen. Right? When you have the correct understanding of Qadr, you, you, it's difficult to get upset over little things and sometimes even big things. I'll give you an example. Right? I'll give you an example. If you know, if you know, that Allah has predestined every single thing, every penny, every cent, every pound, every dollar, you know, every real, every rupee, every euro, whatever. If Allah has already written down how much you will earn, okay, if Allah has already written this down, and no matter how hard you work or how little you work, you will not be able to get a single penny more than what Allah has already decreed for you. And you understand 
that even though this is the case, Allah has still told you to work for your money, then you won't worry about money. Why? Because you know that no matter how much I try, and whether I look at halal means or I look at haram means, I will not get more than what Allah has decreed for me. So I should still work because Allah did not tell us to not work and just sit in the masjid 24-7. No, Allah told us to work. The Prophet ﷺ, he told us to go away and earn our living. However, you earn your living and then you leave it to Allah. You do your bit and then you leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you don't worry, right? You don't worry. And this is the beauty of Qadr, right? You, that you don't worry. You don't need to worry. When I have Allah protecting me, I don't need to worry. Okay, so this is an important aspect of Qadr. How do we believe in Qadr? Well, number one, we believe that Allah created everything, including our actions. We believe that Allah knows everything that is going to happen. And that everything that has happened and everything that didn't happen and everything that would have happened if something else happened but didn't happen and so on and so forth, right? Allah knows everything. He is able to do everything. He's decreed everything including our actions and He wills everything. Nothing can happen without the will of Allah. Yet at the same time, He has given us a free will. However, our free will is within the will of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala wa ma tasha'una illa an yasha Allah rabbul alamin you do not will except that Allah lord of the worlds will so this in this indicates there's an affirmation that you have a free will right and then that free will is under the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is why we should always be making dua anyway okay let's have a look at some more questions the problem i have is it's very difficult for, i don't know how this facebook works because for some reason it doesn't show me all the questions during the live uh live feed for some reason I, i'm really confused on how this thing works um but we'll try anyway it shows me some questions or some comments what's the best way to make dua from sister jamila um there are different etiquettes of making dua so one is raising your hands Another is to make wudu. Um, you don't have to do all of these, by the way. But these just help to increase the likelihood of your dua being answered. You know, being in a state of wudu, facing the qibla, raising your hands like this, calling Allah by His names, like Ya Rabb, O oh my Lord. For example, Ya Hayyu, Ya Qayyum, you know, and, and whatever else. If you're asking for forgiveness, then ask Him by the names that are related to forgiveness, like Ya Ghafoor. Ya Rahim, and so on and so forth. O forgiver, O merciful, show mercy on me. Right? And things like this. Uh, obviously, uh, another etiquette of making dua is to do it, to repeat it multiple times. Um, so there are a number of different et etiquettes. Uh, that's a quick summary. Muhammad Fahad says, How are you? Alhamdulillah, I'm fine, Muhammad Fahad. How are you, brother? Uh, Aisha says assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh watching from dubai uae mashallah alhamdulillah we are fine majid wasiu wasiu i'm not sure how to pronounce your name brother forgive me if it's wrong salam watching from ghana wa alaikum uh, salam to you and to the muslims of ghana ghana uh, arum arum dewi anjani says assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam Muhammad Amin Aminki says Assalamu Alaikum Wa Alaikum As Salam. Dennis Sose, Salam, my brother from Bosnia. Wa Alaikum As Salam. I, I like this guy Dennis because mashallah he's always messaging at every every Ask AA and uh, and Makkah live sessions. Mashallah. Uh, don't worry, however you pronounce my name, it is okay for me. May Allah uh, give you the give us all the best. Amin. And yes, I always ask, do, do I pronounce it correctly? So that's why he's replying to that. Um, doot, doot, doot. Asma al Qaram, because I did not uh, fail, f felt the hot in my cry, in my dua. I'm not quite sure what you mean. Um, maybe you can repeat that. I, I don't really quite understand. If you can explain that, that'll be good. Al Iman Yazid wa Yanqus, Yazidu bil Ta'ah wa Yanqusu bil Isyan. That's correct, which means that Iman increases 
and decreases, it increases with obedience to Allah, doing good deeds, and it decreases by disobeying Allah, in other words, doing bad deeds. Hafsat Isa Zmaliki uh, says, Salamu alaykum from Nigeria. Wa alaykum as salam, mashallah. Princess Ira Matalam says, Assalamu alaykum, I'm watching in Riyadh. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, princess. Okay, Megan Williams says, Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, watching from Trinidad and Tobago. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That's amazing. We've got people from all over the world. That's really, really amazing. Muhammad Amin Aminki. True, in fact, my name is Muhammad. I live in, I live in Kenya. I really love one day to visit Mecca. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you the ability to visit Mecca uh, one day, insha'Allah ta'ala, and many times, over and over again. Whereabouts are you in Kenya? Right? I, I, I'm going to try and visit Kenya at some point in my life. Um, let me know where you are, inshallah. That's amazing, actually, to know that. Uh, your books, mashallah. Aisha Estandarte. Uh, my books. Oh, you're talking about these. Okay. Uh, Alhamdulillah. May Allah make us people who benefit from the books. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make these books a hujjah, uh, a proof for us and not against us. Assalamu alaikum from, oh God, I have no idea how to pronounce your name. Um, I don't even know what language that's in, in all honest. Na'am uh, wallah, Allahumma gfir lana dhambana ya Rabb. Ameen, ameen, astaghfirullah Rabbi, ameen, ameen. Ameen, olo ronimbi, mashaAllah, I'm not sure how to pronounce that name, I'm really terrible at names, so please forgive me brothers and sisters. Um, Lives in Houston, studies, studied at, in London, mashallah, awesome. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you brother? Have you left Mecca? Alhamdulillah, I'm fine. I uh, hope you're well also. I actually injured my arm. Um, Alhamdulillah, it turned out not to be a fracture, but something quite minor. Uh, just like a little sprain. So Alhamdulillah. Um, have I left Mecca? No, I haven't left Mecca. I'm currently in Mecca right now. Um, Sayyid Yahya says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. Ameen. Olo Ronimbi says, I cannot hear you now. Um, I, can, uh, I can't hear you either. <laughs> I can't hear you either. Uh, I think you, I don't know if you can hear me now, but uh, maybe refresh the page or something like that. Uh, Neko, Neko Priscilla says, Assalamu alaikum. I come from Mauritius. How are you? Wa alaikum as salam, Neko. Uh, really great to hear, subhanAllah, people from all over the world, mashaAllah ta'ala. Mohsin Ayyub, Jazakallah for everything. Uh, Mohsin, Gazana uh, Wayak, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you also, my brother. Jamila Diwan Jawid says, Salam bro, please. Wa alaikum as salam. Can you tell me if my prayers are accepted if I sit and pray as I have health problems? But someone has told me that your prayers are not accepted because I can't sit on the floor and do suj sajda. Please can you advise me? Jazakallahu khairan, my brother. Jamila, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you a fast and complete recovery. Ameen, ya rabbal alameen. Everybody say ameen. Um, the answer to your question, okay. If a person has an illness that stops that person from being able to stand, then they don't need to stand, right? But if they can make sajda, then they should make sajda. If they can sit down, then they should sit down, even if they can't stand. So you can sit down during the standing part, but you must do everything else if you have the ability to do so. If you can't make the sajda, right, but you can stand, you should stand. And then you maybe sit down and try your best to make sajda. So the point is, do whatever of the salah you have the ability to do, and the rest of it, you can either sit down or bow or, you know, however, whatever is easy for you. But the key point here is do whatever you are able to do, right? Whatever you're able to do, you do that much. And the rest of the salah, um, you can do in a lesser manner, right? So if you can't pray standing, you pray sitting. If you can't pray sitting, then you pray lying down. If you can't pray lying down, you can even pray with your eyes. Because the prayer is not exempted from anybody who is sane and above 
the age of puberty, right? Asma al Qaram says, Subhanallah, every time we found Wallahu yuhibbul mutatahirin, al mutatahirin wa tawabin. Allah loves us whenever we make our iman new and new every time, subhanAllah. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. Every time we do acts of worship, our iman increases. Jazakillahu khairan. Please talk in Arabic and English. Uh, I'll try and do some lectures in Arabic, inshaAllah ta'ala. My main focus actually is in English and the reason why I do have private lectures where I teach in Arabic. However, my main focus is in English is because Alhamdulillah, there's so many scholars in the Arabic language uh, you know, they are far, far, far more knowledgeable than me and uh, they have, uh, you know, much better than me in, in almost every aspect, if not all aspects. So you can go to them when it comes to the Arabic language. So I try and um, do it in, uh, in English because many people, we don't have access to scholars around the world uh, or students of knowledge like myself uh, around the world. So we try and, uh, you know, make that bridge between the scholars and the people, inshallah. Okay, uh, my mistake, brother, I can hear you now. That's what I mean. Jazakallah khair. Fatima, Fatima. She asks, Sheikh, do the angels with us see when couples do their business? Right. <laughs> the short answer is yes, they can. Some of the angels, not all of them. Some of them can. So that's the short answer, inshallah. Okay. Uh, but for example, when you go into the toilet, when you say Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al khubuthi wal khaba'ith, then the angels stop outside so they don't go in. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Okay, Bawar Khan says, Salam brother, I have a question. If a man, if a Muslim man is living in the EU, is it possible to shake their hand with women? As I know this is not allowed, please tell me about this. Uh, yes, it's, it's not allowed for not just a Muslim man to touch a Muslim woman, but also a Muslim woman to touch a Muslim man who is not mahram to them. And, you know, some people with the media and some nefarious people, unscrupulous people, they misinterpret this to mean that, you know, somehow this is disrespectful towards women or even towards men or whatever it is. No, this is not out of disrespect, okay? In Islam, we give the utmost amount of respect to women. It is actually out of respect that we don't engage in relations outside of the marital relations or, you know, biological relations like brother, sister, uh, uh, parents, children, and so on and so forth, aunties and uncles, direct aunties and uncles and, and grandparents and all of that, right? So you shouldn't touch someone of the opposite gender, whether you're a male or a female, right? The ruling is across the board. Some people, they try to misinterpret this, oh, women are not good for you and all of this nonsense. No, that's complete nonsense. In Islam, we have the utmost respect for women. It is not, it's got nothing to do with disrespect. In fact, it's the opposite. It is out of respect that we don't do that. Okay. Um, and it's because, of course, this is something that our messenger, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, taught us. Uh, please, brother, tell me about this smallest Quran from Iran. Is it complete or not? Someone brought it to me. To be honest, I don't know because I haven't seen it, so I won't be able to answer that question. Yahya says, uh, is an electronic keyboard permissible to have if it's not using any actual strings in it like a real piano instrument and the sound is purely synthetic, fake, artificial? Well, the, hmm, good question. I don't know how these electronic keyboards are made. Right, I don't know uh, how they're made. Are they made from vocals? I mean, there's got to be a sound that comes from somewhere, right? The original sound, the, you know, they have to be able to uh, get a sound to be able to manipulate it. If that original sound is pure, then it would be permissible. So for example, if it comes from the human voice, then of course that's permissible. If it doesn't, then, and it, you know, like I said, I don't want to answer that question because I don't know how these things are, are made. And therefore, it's not permissible for me to speak without knowledge. But the bit that I do know, if it's made from a human voice, then that would be permissible. I don't think they are made from human voices. So uh, I won't be able to answer that question. Okay. Uh, tell him to read and make dua. I'm not sure what that question is. Uh, Basir Khan says, I'm not punctual in my salah. Give me some advice. 
Okay, brother, this is a really good thing. How do we become punctual in our salah? The first thing to do, brothers and sisters, the first thing to do, right, is to make dua to Allah, right? Make dua and beg Allah sincerely, Oh Allah, make me firm in my salah. And do it sincerely. That's the first thing to do, right? The second thing to do is to have a firm resolve that from today I will never miss another prayer in my life. Even if I accidentally, you know, if I accidentally don't get up or something like this, right? For Fajr, I will still get up. As soon as I get up, I will pray. But I intend every night before I go to sleep to get up. I set my alarm. I ask people around me to remind me to pray. You know, nowadays on your smartphones, you can have apps that remind you to pray. The key thing, number one, make dua. Number two, have a firm resolve. Number three, surround yourself with people who pray, right? And who will remind you to pray. Uh, and number four, try and go to the masjid as, as often as possible. Number five, try and learn the meaning of the prayer. Okay, try and learn the meaning of the prayer. I have a course about this. It's called, uh, you can see it, it's called Spiritual Salah, www.spiritualsalah.com. So have a look at that course. Um, if that's of, uh, inshallah, we go through how to enjoy your prayer, right? Through the meaning of the salah. So things like this are really important. Uh, but most, um, uh, you know, the most important thing is to force yourself to pray. Get into the habit. At the beginning, it's going to be difficult. A few days will go by. A few weeks will go by. It might be difficult. But then after a few months, it becomes part and parcel of your life. And if someone offered you a hundred million pounds to miss one prayer, you would not miss the prayer because you love the prayer so much. So please try and be punctual by doing these things that I just mentioned. Asma Al Qaram says, Ma'arifatullahi bi asma'ihi wa sifatihi tuqawwil iman wa tuzidu. Sahih. Sahih. Hada sahih. So knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing His names and attributes, it increases your iman. And this is absolutely correct. It strengthens and increases your iman. Assalamu alaikum from Maha Maryam. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother, how are you? I'm from the UK. Alhamdulillah, I'm fine. Uh, hope you're well as well. Uh, I'm also from the UK. Um, how can I know that Allah has forgiven me for the sin which I ask for forgiveness? Um, actually, we don't know for certain. But there are signs. The signs are when we really feel remorse for that sin. We genuinely feel upset that we did that sin. Number two, we stop doing that sin. And number three, we have a firm resolve to never go back to that sin. When we do that, then inshallah, we can feel confident that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have forgiven us. The main thing is sincerity. And you know, we don't know because there's nothing that Allah tells us that yes, your sin is forgiven, but He's given us signs. And they are some of the signs. And actually they're the conditions of uh, our, um, our repentance being accepted. Siti uh, Jane Ayub Quimbo says, Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam. Amin says, that's correct. I'm presuming you're talking about your name. Adil says, Salam, Sheikh, and he's making cheeky comments. Wa alaikum assalam. Stop being cheeky. Uh, marhaba, marhaba says, Do you live in Mecca? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. Uh, Jamila says, Jazakallah khairan, uh, my brother, <laughs> you have put my mind at rest. Alhamdulillah, I never miss my prayers, regardless of some people trying to put you off. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you highly, inshallah. Ameen, ameen, wa iyaakum, ameen. Um, Sittina Aisha, Aisha Muhammad says, Brother, can you tell me about Umrah? How to do it from start to finish? Wow, what a question. That's like gonna take me a long time but let me just very quickly how do you do umrah you get into ihram okay uh once you get into ihram you go to mecca when you get and you must do get into ihram either at the miqat uh if you're not from the living inside the miqat if you're living inside the miqat area then you get into ihram from wherever you intend to do the umrah uh, once you get into the ihram, you come to Mecca, you do tawaf seven times anti-clockwise, beginning with Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, you make any dua around the 
three faces of the Kaaba, and then the fourth face, uh, which is at the aft starts at the Yemeni corner, or it is between the Yemeni corner and the Black Stone, you say, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab nar You repeat this seven times, and then you perform, you do two rakahs, you drink zamzam, and then you do the sa'i, which is walking from Safa to Marwa. So at Safa, you make a, you say, Inna Safa wal Marwa ta min sha'air Allah, fa man hajj al bayta awa tamara, fala junaha alayhi an yattawwa fa bihima, wa man tatawwa khayran fa inna Allah shakirun alim. And then, uh, and this you only say at the beginning, uh, and then you say, and you only do this once at Safa. And then after that, both at Safa and Marwa, you read this dua. Uh, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah wahda, la sharika lah, lahu al-mulku wa lahu alhamdu wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir, la ilaha illallah wahda, anjaza wa'da, wa nasara abda, wa hazam al-ahzab wahda. You do that, then you make your own dua. You do that dua again, and you make your own dua, then you do that dua again, and then you don't make your own dua, then you go towards marwa, and if you're a man, you run between where the green lights area is, and you make any dua up to marwa. At marwa, you do the same thing, and then you come back to Safa and you do this seven times, you end up at Marwa and for the eighth time you make that same dua, then your own dua, then that same dua, then your own dua, then that same dua. And then you go away and you cut your hair or if you're a man you can also shave it and that is the end of your Umrah. So that is a whirlwind um, tour on Umrah but try and get a book on how to do your Umrah inshallah so that you can do it properly. Jason Chowdhury, brother what is Arsh? Allah's Arsh. Allah has told us about a creation of His called the Arsh. And this Arsh uh, is a throne. It literally means a, a throne. And uh, that's it. it. You know, Allah, the Messenger said, وَكَانَ عَرْشُهُ عَلَى الْمَاءِ his, his throne was above the waters. Uh, so we, you know, the, the, and the Arsh is huge, is absolutely huge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in Surah Al-Rahman, Allah says, Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa. Right? Ar-Rahman, who is Allah, uh, the most merciful, he rose over his throne. Now, of course, we don't try to imagine how did Allah rise over his throne? How, you know, does he sit on his throne? And all of these things, we don't try to imagine any of this. Um, Allah does so in a way that befits his majesty. We don't reject these ayat. We don't reject the meanings of these words. However, we can never know the how uh, because Allah hasn't told us how these things happen. We can't imagine it. In fact, it's wrong to imagine it. Uh, so therefore, we just accept them, these ayat, as they came without questioning how. Can someone do Umrah for their dead family member before you do Hajj for them? Or do we do Hajj for them, then Umrah after? You can. You can do Umrah for them um, if that person, of course, died as a Muslim. Then, and if you've done your own Umrah, then yes, it is permissible for you to do Umrah for them. And same thing with Hajj. Al Qiran bi Kasr al Qaf. Tayyib. Zakinla khair. That's her name. So I pronounced it incorrectly. Safin. Oh, Safin Akhtar. MashaAllah. Zakinla khair. Maria says, Amin. Isin Sanane says, Salam, brother. Allah give peace and harmony to all Muslims around the world. Amin. Amin, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Asma al Qiram. Barakallahu fikum nafa abikum. Salami il al aila jami'an. Wa alaykum as salam. Min al ustadha Asma al Qiram. Barakallahu fikum aidan. Wa alaykum as salam. Wa rahmatullahi wa Okay, I'm just trying to pull up the comments. I had to refresh. I've got a notification. Adil Raja is watching you. MashaAllah. Uh, Uzma Wahid says, Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Right. Um, salam, brother, from Asim Safdar. Wa alaikum as salam, ya Asim. Just tuning in from Khubar. MashaAllah, you're not far from me. Khubar. Well, it is kind of far, but you know. Was in Mecca over the weekend. MashaAllah, did you make dua for me? That's the question. By name. Uh, very, very busy. Yes, especially at weekends, it does get really, really busy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your Umrah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all the Muslims a chance to do Umrah. Okay, and Hajj. Uh, Muhammad Sharif says, 
How are you, my sweet brother? Alhamdulillah, my sweet brother. Alhamdulillah, I am fine. How are you? Let me know. Okay. Um, I can't actually see any other questions. But what is strange is when I log off, then a whole bunch of questions pop up. Like, the, So it's a little bit weird why I can't see everything. Here we go. Some have more popped up. Serene uh, Samira says, Assalamu alaikum, how are you? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, I am fine. Um, I'm watching from Bangladesh. Masha Allah ta'ala. That's amazing. Yusuf! Yusuf! Assalamu alaikum. Masha Allah, Yusuf. Hayak Allah wa bayak. It's really good to hear from you, Yusuf. Tayyib, you miss me. Ma tattasil bi. Ishbuk ya sheikh. Khalina natawasal insha Allah. Hal anta fi Makkah. Khalina natawasal ya Yusuf. Hayak Allah. Farihat. Mi qiraat al... Al ta'aliq. An indak. Tayyib. Ittasil bi. Ittasil bi. Da anta fi Makkah. Tayyib. Fatima. Seed. I'm not 100% sure. Ant fi Maghrib ya sheikh. ايش بك؟ ما شاء الله سترجع طيب المهم ارسل لي رقمك ها ارسل لي رقمك على الخاص يعني ارسل لي رقمك ها طيب فاطمه says do guiding angels talk to their humans they guide the inner voice angels do they talk to us no they don't um, they can talk to us they can talk to us um, but if they appear in the form of a man. For example, in the hadith of Jibreel, Jibreel alayhi salam came in the form of a man uh, to the Sahaba and to others. Likewise, uh, in a hadith where a man was going to another town to visit a brother, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet said, Allah sent an angel to speak to this person, most likely in the form of a man. And he said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to such and such a town. Why are you going there? To visit my brother. Uh, for the sake of Allah, because why you visit him? Because I love him. Is that the only reason that you're visiting him? Uh, he said, yes. He said, do you have anything else that you want from him? Is there some business that, or does he owe you something? He's, uh, the man said, no. He said, then I'm an angel who has been sent to you by Allah to tell you that Allah loves you. Allah Akbar. Amazing hadith, by the way. And it shows the importance of visiting each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, but it also shows that yes, angels can speak to human beings in the form of a man. Uh, normally we won't know that they are angels. So um, don't try and say that yes, an angel has come to me and told me I don't need to pray or something like that. Indira Ali says, Assalamu alaikum from New York City. Great job, Abu. Wa alaikum as salam, Indira. Mashallah from New York City. That is amazing. We've got people tuned in from the complete west of the world. Right, and then you've got people all the way from the east. I love hearing and reading where you guys are from. So please do send me that. Even if you don't make any other comment, I want to hear where you're from. So let me know. Uh, Kareem Ibn Sikandar says, "Assalamu alaikum." Watching from the U USA. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Barakatuh, my brother Kareem. Whereabouts in the USA? Let me know. Whereabouts? Okay, who else have we got here? Uh, Asim Safdar. Asim says, I am in CXWMS. Okay, Asim, I think I know who you are. I think you messaged me once and we were supposed to meet up and I don't think we ever did. So, um, yes, great. Send me a message, inshallah. We'll catch up, inshallah. Awesome. Uh, Muhammad Sharif says, Alhamdulillah, I'm very fine, my brother. Alhamdulillah, that's awesome. Uh, Ummi Fabiha says, I'm from Khobar, mashallah, mashallah, Allahumma barik. I'm from Australia, wow! So we got all the way from the US, all the way from Australia, and everything in between. That is Esin Sanani. Okay, um, probably not pronouncing that correctly. Maybe it's Ihsan, I'm not sure. But yeah, mashallah, awesome. From Australia, enjoy your talks. Jazakallah khair for your kind words. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept everything that we do, all small things. Ameen. Kareem Hero says, Salam brother. Wa alaikum as-salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
Fatima says, can someone have a dream about Allah? Yes, you can dream about Allah, but of course you won't necessarily see Allah. So you might dream that Allah says something to you or does, you know, or, or whatever that is possible. Allah knows best. What do you advise someone who is going through hardships? Okay, uh, Sister Shifa Norman, I've actually done a lecture on this. Um, I've done a lecture on this um, about hardships. So uh, go back to that. It's just maybe a few videos down. Uh, when I was in the UK, I did a video. Uh, it's called something like, uh, Does Allah Care For Me? Or something like that. If somebody else can maybe find that video and paste the link as a reply to Shifa, then that would be great. But in a nutshell, we all go through tests, we all go through hardships. And in fact, the Prophet ﷺ went through the greatest of hardships. If you look at, you know, if somebody's lost their children, look at the Prophet ﷺ. He lost all of his children except for Fatima radiallahu anha in his lifetime, right? Um, likewise, he lost his spouse. So if somebody's lost their spouse, look at the example of the Prophet ﷺ. If someone's got kicked out of their home, the Prophet ﷺ was get kicked out of his city. If someone was physically harmed, the Prophet ﷺ was stoned at Ta'if. He was, a, a, a spear went through his, mole, uh, his cheek and his molar tooth came out in the Battle of Uhud. So there's, you know, if someone's been slandered or their spouse has been slandered, the Prophet ﷺ was called a madman, a magician, a soothsayer, a poet, a liar. You know, so the Prophet ﷺ went through every single type of slander, every single, sorry, every single type of hardship and trial and tribulation. So don't think that just because you're going through hardships, Allah doesn't care about you. No, that's not the case, right? What that, it can be, it can be a punishment, but it can also be a way for you to, your sins to be forgiven. So Allah doesn't punish you in the hereafter. It's also a way for you to make dua to Allah, to get closer to Allah. Maybe you don't normally make dua, so Allah is giving you a trial, a tribulation, a, a test, a hardship to go through because Allah knows that you make dua more when you are going through this trial and tribulation. So make that dua. Uh, likewise, perhaps Allah is doing that so that you don't get punished in the hereafter. Allah wants to punish you in this world. Maybe it's to raise your rank in the hereafter so that you get better and more in Jannah, right? So don't think that just because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is you know, allowing you to go through hardships that Allah doesn't love you. No, turn back to Allah. Use this as a way to get close to Allah. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, I went through a trial a few years ago and I promise you that trial was really painful, really difficult, really tough. Okay, and I eventually found that I had no one to speak to, nobody, right, except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And during those times, it was probably the closest time that I ever got to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, and if you were to, you know, if, and of course we should never ask Allah to give us trials, may Allah protect us from hardship and trial. However, if you were, if I was allowed to turn the clock back and go back to that time when I was going through that trial, I would go through it all over again. It was a few years of pain and hardship, but you know what? I would do it again. Why? Because the person I became after that trial was a completely different person. During that trial, I experienced you know, a relationship with Allah that I've never experienced before that, right? So don't give up. Don't think that Allah's deserted you. No, my brother, no, my sister. No, that's not the case, right? This is a way for you to get close to Allah. So use it in that way. Use it in that way. Um, so that was from Sister Shifa. Adil, when is week six of spiritual salah coming out? Very good question. Um, the problem is I budgeted four weeks because originally the course was supposed to be four weeks and then very quickly it was clear that i'm not going to finish it in four weeks so i needed six weeks um so the fifth week i managed to do right but because of traveling i travel like just literally in the in since the beginning of this year in just three months i've probably traveled about six times or maybe more right maybe six or more times i've traveled so i travel a lot Okay, so that is, uh, and then on top of that, I got ill a few times. So because of that, I know it's not a good excuse. But because of that, I haven't managed to prepare the notes for Spiritual Salah point six. Actually, I was working on them today. So I'm hoping that this week sometime, inshallah, please make dua that Allah gives me the ability to do so, um, gives me the tawfiq to do so. In fact, today I was working on it and then I had to go to a hospital for like four hours. Um, but alhamdulillah, there's nothing serious as I mentioned earlier on. 
So Alhamdulillah. Uh, so inshallah, hopefully we'll do that soon. All right. Sana Beg says, Salam. Wa alaykum as salam. I find your two to three minute reminders so beneficial. Jazakallahu khairan from London. Jazakallah khair Sana for your kind words. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept them from all of us. Um, and you know, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us ikhlas and accept all of these things. Ameen. Adil Raja says, what's your advice when looking for a spouse? What should we look for? Adil, why are you asking this question? I wonder. Um, actually, the Prophet wasallam told us, uh, he told us what to look for. He says, فَذْفَرْ بِذَاتِ الدِّينِ Right? Be successful with the one who has deen. Right? Be successful with the one who has deen. And notice the Prophet ﷺ did not say be successful in the hereafter. He, he just said be successful. So that means your success in this world and the next. The success in your marriage. The success in bringing up your children. Success in your family, in barakah and happiness of this world. As well as success of, of the hereafter. So be you know, the first and most important thing to look for in a spouse is the one who has deen. Who, and I, I don't just mean, you know, outward deen. No, there's many people who have outward deen. They grow the beard, they wear the niqab, hopefully not at the same time. But, you know, many people have outward deen. But we want people who don't just have outward deen, have inward deen. How do we know this? You know, for example, people who don't backbite, don't slander, they don't hold grudges against people, they don't hate other people, Muslims, they don't get angry quickly. I know... You know, we're asking for someone from Jannah. But at least try and find somebody who prays five times a day. You know, by themselves, for the sake of Allah. Somebody who really wants to be close to Allah. Somebody who has that desire. And then, of course, you can look for all of the other signs of piety. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all people of Iman and Taqwa. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Kareem Hero says, I like your video. Allah give you long life. Ameen, Ameen. Wa iyak. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all long lives as long as they are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may Allah take us take our lives at the best of times for our akhirah ameen ya rabbal alamin if someone has an important dream who is the best person to ask your dream uh, dreams meaning um, i don't actually know to be honest sister fatima i don't interpret dreams i don't know how to interpret dreams so that is beyond my level of um, uh, knowledge, unfortunately, so I'm sorry, I don't know how to answer that question. Marlia Hadi, uh, oh Allah, grant me. Oh, by the way, Dr. Bilal Phillips, Sheikh Abu Amina Bilal Phillips, he has a book about dream interpretation. It's worth having a read of that, inshallah. Marlia Hadi, oh Allah, grant me a spouse who is really strong, has a strong iman, and loves me to Jannah. Amin. Amin to that dua. Uh, and all for the brothers and for all of the brothers and sisters who are looking to get married. Maha Maryam says, Brother, how can I stop doing the sin? Even I want to stop doing that specific sin, but every time I fail. How do we stop doing sin? Firstly, make dua to Allah. I promise you, brother or sister, that when you make dua to Allah, Allah makes things so much easier, so much easier. Okay, so much easier. So make dua over and over and over again. Oh Allah, stop me from doing this sin. Oh Allah, stop me from doing this sin. That's number one. Number two, have a firm resolve to stop doing that sin. Number three, force yourself. Sometimes you are so close to doing that sin, force yourself to not do that sin. Okay, force yourself to not do that sin. And inshallah, over time it will become easier. I'll give you an example, right? I love my tea, my chai. Okay, I love my English tea. And the problem with tea is that it gives you headaches. If you don't have that tea, right? Especially for me, if I don't have tea, then I, I get headaches. So Ramadan's coming up in 45 days. And Ramadan, you're fasting every single day. And the one thing I don't want to do is drink tea at Maghrib time. Why? Because if I drink tea at Maghrib time, tea, as you know, is a diuretic and it makes you go to the loo. And uh, going to the haram from my house is a mission in Ramadan. It takes probably, you know, like, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, so you break your fast and then you rush to get to the haram and then you pray your taraweeh and then by the time you get back it's like 12.30 to 1 o'clock by the time we get back home. Uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, 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 you know, I, I cannot ever complain. It's a blessing uh, from Allah just to be able to be here in Ramadan. However, the problem with that is you don't go to the toilet for four, five, six, seven hours, right? Probably about seven hours you can't go to the toilet. So that's why I need to give up tea. 
right? Why am I talking about tea when you are asking about sins? Because I need to give up tea before Ramadan. And this is what I do every year, right? I try and I give up tea. It's not sinful to drink tea, but like I said, it just makes your life a bit uncomfortable during Ramadan for me anyway. So therefore, I try and give it up. The last three days, I've cut down from maybe four teas or five teas a day, five cups of tea, four cups of tea a day to just one cup, right? I went cold turkey to one cup, although that's not strictly cold turkey, but you know what I mean. I went four straight to one or five straight to one. Now, I've been having some crazy headaches, right? Crazy headaches. Today was the third day. Today's the third day that I've only had one tea per day. The problem is around, I think it was Asr time, um, or just before Asr, actually it's between Dhor and Asr, I was having some crazy, crazy um, headaches, right? I had caffeine withdrawal symptoms. I was drinking loads of water. I was this close to drinking tea again, right? But I had to force myself, right? I had to force myself. Even though I was going through the pain of the headache, right? But, and I was really close. I was so tempted to get up and just make myself a cup of tea and just say, okay, I'll, I'll try and give up like closer to Ramadan. But then I thought to myself, you know what? I've already gone through two days of hardship. Let me just go through a few more days of hardship and inshallah it'll become easier and those withdrawal symptom headaches will go away. So it's the same thing. The sins are exactly the same. You get those withdrawal symptoms. It is painful. Of course it is. Otherwise it wouldn't be a test. But then you need to be consistent. And when you are consistent and you force yourself, eventually it becomes easy for you to give up that sin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for all of us to give up sins. And you know, every now and then you might fall into that sin again. Right? We all do. I do. Okay? I am not a person who doesn't sin, right? I'm not proud of saying that, but unfortunately that's the reality. And the Prophet said, Adam every son of Adam sins. Uh, but the best of sinners are those who repent. So when you sin, brothers and sisters, don't stay sinning. Quickly remember and quickly get yourself back up and stop sinning as soon as you remember. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq Give us the ability to be strong against sins. Ameen. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Um, Fatima Seed. I really don't know if I'm pronouncing your name properly. Jazakallahu uh, khairan, Shaykh. Wayak. Ameen. Wayak. May Allah bless you endlessly in both worlds. Ameen. Ameen. Jazakumullahu khair for your beautiful du'as. That, those are the kind of du'as that I love. So carry on making du'as for me, all of you. Uh, I need a lot of Allah's forgiveness. Just because I'm here speaking to you from here, Giving you advice, it doesn't mean that I'm not in need of Allah's forgiveness. Quite the contrary. I give uh, lectures and advice based on my knowledge. But that knowledge alone is not enough for a person to go to paradise. So always make dua for me. Wajazakumullahu khairan in private and in public. I mean, uh, in private as well. That's what I meant to say. Um, Hajiya Yasmin says, Brother, I have so many debts that I cannot repay anytime soon, but I have repented from riba. Can I make Hajj or Umrah or do I have to pay it all before? Um... It depends, right? It depends. There are two types of debts. The first type of debt, and before I answer the question, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow you to quickly pay off your debts. I've also been in debts um, many times in my life. I'm probably still in debt, or I am in debt. This is part of our lives, right? Some, some of us, we, we have to take uh, loans for whatever reason. Sometimes that's for business reasons. Sometimes that's for personal reasons. You can't pay off you know, uh, maybe you can't make ends meet or something like that. Make dua to Allah, right? You cannot underestimate the importance of dua, all right? Dua is really important. There's a beautiful dua. Again, there's a whole lecture I've done on it. You can find this on the Facebook videos page. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan wal-ajzi wal-kasal wal-bukhli wal-jubni wal-dala'i al-dayni wa ghalabati al-rajal. Make this dua over and over and over again and inshallah Allah will ease your affairs. Okay, um, so can you make Hajj or Umrah? Uh, if, th there are a number of things. Number one, if the person who you owe money to gives you permis permission to go on Hajj, then that is perfectly fine. That's the first thing, right? So then you can go on Hajj and Umrah. If they, if you, if they give you permission to go and spend that money on Hajj or Umrah instead of giving that loan back, right? Paying that debt back. So then it's fine. Number two, 
if you have an agreement with that person that you will pay, let's say, a hundred pounds every month, and they're perfectly fine with that agreement, right? That every month you pay a hundred pounds, as long as you uh, give that hundred pounds every month, even during the the days of Hajj that you're away, then it's also permissible for you to go on Hajj or Umrah, even though you're still in debt. When it's not permissible is if the person says, you must pay me as soon as you have the money. In this case, you can't go for Hajj and spend money on Hajj when you need to owe someone else money. Unless somebody else has paid for that Hajj for you. Because then you're not paying that money, right? Uh, in that case, you can't. I hope that answers your question, inshallah. Islamically, can we vote? Uzma Wahid, that is a really detailed question. I don't want to really go into that um, because... There is a difference of opinion among the ulama. I have a particular view. Um, and while I don't want to give that view without giving a detailed answer for the reason for that view. So I don't want to go into detail because that's always an issue for conflict um, uh, among people. There is a difference of opinion among the ulama about this. Uh, I have my own view for various reasons. But inshallah, one day I will try and do a whole video over that. But that will take like an hour or two to explain why I believe what I believe. Um, and therefore, I don't want to go into too much detail on the issue of voting uh, right now. Uh, I'd rather do a proper detailed video because otherwise what ends up happening, it becomes to and fro uh, and I don't really have the time for that at this moment in time. Abdul Qayyum, Salam brother, Wa Alaikum Salam. I had hardship last few years, brother. It was so hard for me and I start praying to Hajjud night prayer and made dua to Allah. Even I went Umrah as well. I continue to pray the night prayers. After five or six months, Allah took all my hardship, gave me ease, and it was, it was amazing, brother. Uh, Subhanallah. That's amazing. That's really, really good to hear, brother. And that is what this, these tests are for. Allah says in the Quran, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبَلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Allah is the one who created death and life to test which of you is the best in conduct. So this world is a world of tests and we are always going to be tested. So remember that and this is a way to get us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you tell me something about hijama? Okay, so hijama is cupping and it has a number of different benefits. Um, it can be done on certain days of the month, uh, although those are the sunnah days to do it. It is recommended to do and it helps, it is medicinal and there are many different illnesses that can be cured from hijama. Um, you know, uh, what more can I say? Yeah, I, I mean, I recommend you to do that, inshallah, from someone who's qualified, but learn about it, uh, inshallah ta'ala first. Marliya Hadi says, I have been, I've had a dream about the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, and since that dream changed my life, it's drawn me closer to Allah. Alhamdulillah, thank you for your advice, brother. May Allah reward you the best in this world and the hereafter. Ameen. Uh, Jazakallah khair for your beautiful dua and for your beautiful words. Uh, and it's really amazing that you've had a dream about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it a source of goodness for you in this world and in the next. Muhammad Jabir asks, uh, can you explain what is ruqya? Ruqya is to use ayat of the Quran and to recite those ayat over and over again in order to uh, remove either an illness or a jinn or hasad, uh, envy or ayn, the evil eye. This is what ruqya is. And there are certain ayat that you can recite uh, that the people who are specialized in ruqya, they can tell you about what ayat to recite. So for example, ayatul kursi, for example, surah al-fatiha, for example, the three quls. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq, qul a'udhu bi rabbil nath. Ayat to do with the jinn and so on and so forth. There's different ayat for different medicinal purposes but that is in effect ruqya the correct sunnah ruqya is what is to use the ayat of the quran okay and only the ayat of the quran nothing else uh okay maha mariam says jazakallah khair brother wayak please pray for me and please post that dua on your page which you told it is already on my page if you look for a video um what to do when you're in debt or, or when you're uh, when you're depressed or something like that uh, it's one of those titles. You'll see that inshallah it's already there. Uh, if somebody else can please copy and paste that dua and reply to Maha Maryam's question. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan wal-ajzi wal-kasal wal-bukhri wal-jubni wal-dala'iddayni wa ghalabati rajal Jazakallahu khayran, uh, says Umm Fabiha. 
Uh, Amin wa iyak. Jazakallah khairan, brothers and sisters, for your questions. I'm absolutely shattered now. Um, it is midnight here in Mecca. Insha'Allah ta'ala, we will do this every week at this same time. And I'll try and, and do it ad hoc uh, during the week as well. But inshallah, definitely Mondays, um, 9 p.m. London time, 11 p.m. Mecca time. Uh, inshallah ta'ala, uh, we will try and do uh, take your questions every week. Um, so yes, let us, uh, you know, if you have any questions, do write them, inshallah, write in with your questions and the team will put them together so that I can answer them. Wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Jazakumullahu khairan brothers and sisters for remaining here uh, all this time. Do share this video please because we do want lots of people to benefit from these questions um, and these answers and we try and get the reward from that. So please do share this video and share the videos. Put yourselves on notifications. Um, of this page so that you get notifications every time we go live inshallah ta'ala uh, i'm your brother once again abu abdis salam live from mecca i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept everything that we have said and any good that has uh, has come from this is from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala any bad is from myself and from shaitan i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the highest levels of jannah without any reckoning or punishment. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, keep me in your du'as and don't forget to share this video.